All right, if you grab your Bibles, we'll be in 2 Corinthians 11 today. Hopefully you enjoy Christmas songs. I used to be a you know, hard-nosed, no Christmas before Thanksgiving, uh, but it keeps starting sooner and sooner and sooner because I, I enjoy the songs. Um, the ensemble, when I took them out about a month ago, complimented me by saying that I didn't repeat the same message. Um, I think they just wanted Culver's. Uh, <laughs> And I heard that you got Culver's Sunday night, too, so it worked with Pastor Mitchell as well, so good job. Um, I'm not going to ruin that today, so you get the same message again. Uh, I had to tell them that because they might not recognize it. You know, it's, it's <laughs> who knows how, how alert they were. I'm kidding. I didn't see them sleeping. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, <clears throat> we'll start there. We talk about the simplicity that is in Christ. Ensemble, we do have a slightly different uh, application towards the end, so there'll be a little bit of new material. If you're, you're thinking, was I sleeping last time for that? It, it might be the new part. All right, the simplicity that is in Christ. Let's read verse 3. <clears throat> but I fear lest by any means, as a servant beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. All right, the word simplicity there has the idea of singleness or sincerity, or without pretense or hypocrisy, the simplicity that is in Christ. And today I just want to, to uh, think about that for a little bit. That we'll talk about salvation and then some other, just some simple Bible truths. And sometimes we, we, we hear them all the time and they kind of bounce off our mind and don't really uh, hit us like they should. So, so uh, the simplicity that is in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you'd help us as we... Look in your word that we would remind ourselves of these simple, but Lord, really in many ways, very profound truths, and let them filter all the way through our lives to every part of it, and Lord, really all of your word, but Lord, especially today, the, the parts that you've brought my mind to. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, <clears throat> this idea of simplicity isn't unique to this passage. Uh, Jesus basically says the same thing when we're told that we should be like little children, All right? And that's a, a pretty, some of you are thinking, I've got that one, <laughs> Ask my dorm mom. Um, little children, uh, that is a pretty good picture. Um, <clears throat> there's food in the cafeteria down there for lunch today, and it's a staff kids hot lunch day. Um, the elementary kids that are on staff, their parents on staff, they're, they're not in class wondering, I hope they're cooking lunch. They're just, they're just going to go down and get in line and get lunch because they've been told there's lunch today. They're going to go get it. They're not worried about it. They've been promised lunch. Uh, they're not fretting over it, wondering if it's going to happen. Or um, if you've ever been with a little kid in a car, um, thinking of Olivia once, we were going to Michigan City. And um, I, w I forget what route we went, probably down 12 and not 20. And uh, she said, Dad, are we going to Michigan City? It might have been one of the others, but we'll go with Olivia. And I said, oh, yeah, we're going a different route. And she said, oh, okay, and went back to whatever she was doing. Just, Dad said we're going to Michigan City. Different route. I don't have to worry about it. Like a little child. <clears throat> when I was a kid, I remember riding my dad on his motorcycle. Um, now, as an adult... That is one of the most terrifying things you could ever do. <laughs> Get behind somebody on a motorcycle, even Colt. <laughs> I want to drive, all right? There's something scary about a motorcycle when you're in behind the driver. But as a little kid, I thought it was great. We'd be going around on, on the roads, and he's leaning on the curves, and I'd put my head up to catch the wind full face. and uh, It was great fun. I just, Dad said, we're going to go on a ride. I'm going to go. And in many ways, that should be our approach to God. God said this, let's go. We don't have to worry about the details. Now, as an adult, I'm thinking about, you know, there, there could be rocks in that curve, and the front tire is going to slip out, and then we're going to slide across the pavement, and, or a car is going to come across the yellow line. You know, I'm thinking about all those things as an adult. But God says we should be like children. Just take what he says and believe it. <clears throat> uh, Satan is really, really good at complicating things, taking the simple message of salvation, simple godly living, and making it look bad or somehow incomplete. Drop down to verse 13 of the same chapter. 
For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. <clears throat> Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Excuse me. Satan's good at making all that he offers look really inviting and really wholesome. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a temptation. I mean, Satan's not stupid. He's not going to come to you and say, now, <clears throat> if you make this decision and do what I want and show you 15 years down the road, this is what's going to happen, but please do this really stupid and simple thing right now. He doesn't do that. He makes us think it's good or wholesome or somehow satisfying. Right, so this idea of the simplicity of Christ, we can miss it. And Satan's really good at hanging out in front of us. If you're a hunter in the room, hopefully uh, you don't go out hunting and you know, like with a little speaker and you know, music playing and you know, maybe you're getting some, uh, doing jumping jacks while you're waiting just to keep the blood flowing because it's cold. You, know, you, you want that, the animal to think it's safe and wholesome and then you kill it. Right? <laughs> and that, Satan's good at that. He wants us to think whatever we're doing is good and wholesome and then the trap springs. So, so don't, don't think, oh, I've, I've got this one. No, no, it's possible to miss it. Satan is going to hang those temptations out and make them look good. When he came to Eve, he didn't say, now eat this fruit and you're going to plunge all of mankind into sinful existence for the next 6,000 years and there'll be wars and death and disease and pain, but please take this bite. <laughs> he didn't say that. He told her to open her eyes and improve her life. Right. Satan's good at making it look good. Um, a fisherman, you know, he gets that lure and throws it out there, and he wants that fish to think it's something good to eat. Right? Now, we can't talk to fish, but you don't know, say, you know, fish, please bite this so I can fillet you and, <laughs> and cook you in uh, pan-fried, a little, little light breading, pan-fried and butter, a little salt and pepper and garlic salt. Mm. Mm. The lake's not frozen. We could go this afternoon. All right. The, the a fisherman does, he hides that intent. And that's what Satan is good at, at, at hiding those things from us. Right? At times like that, we, we, we are pr presented with something that we, in our mind, we know it's wrong, but we, we really want to step out there and do it. At those points, and others, but at that point as well, We've got to have enough faith in God. This is what God said. Everything in me screams to do this thing that God says is wrong. I'm going to obey God. It's as simple as that. I'm going to obey God. The Bible says in Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to believe God. Or, I'm sorry, uh, to please God. And I used to take that as just like this, you know, like, oh, yes, I've got faith, so somehow I can possibly please God. I really think it comes down to times like that. You've got the decision, and you're so tempted to do the wrong thing, and you've got to say, you know what, I believe God, and you do the right thing. Without faith, we're going to be doing the wrong thing. Satan's good at giving us this wrong thing, making it look good and tasty. We have to have enough faith as a simple child in what God says to do the right thing. <clears throat> We're going to look at, like I said, several uh, simple statements in the Bible, or simple thoughts from the Bible, and how, we can, how they should affect us, really. So the first area we'll look at is salvation, and we'll look at several other areas of just basic Christian living and Christian doctrine and how that should apply to us. Let's talk about salvation. Uh, this is really the most direct uh, application of this passage. There was a group of uh, Judaizers who had come and were wanting to add uh, all kinds of things to salvation. And he would say, no, no, the simplicity of that is in Christ. Bring it back to the, to the basics of salvation. Um, and I want to I walk through some of the, the, the basic uh, points and doctrines about salvation. And just hopefully in, in your mind, remind yourself of how wonderful this is. 
Well, maybe not the pr- first point. We're sinners that have disobeyed God. <laughs> but salvation as a whole, how wonderful it is. And really some very simple statements that a child can understand and receive Christ. Sometimes we gloss over and just lose the beauty of what's there. So, All right, the first point. We are sinners that have disobeyed a holy God. Again, that's not a beautiful thought, but that's the truth. You are a sinner who has disobeyed a holy God. Not, not a, a, you know, a grouchy parent. Oh, no parents are grouchy. Okay. Not that mean teacher. A holy God. You've disobeyed him. First John tells us, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of of the law. That's God's description of sin. There's no special deals with God. Right? Sometimes <clears throat> if you go to, somebody's, to someone's house to play a game or maybe in the snack shop, um, people have their own house rules for certain games. All right? There's no house rules. Well, there's God's house. It's his rules. <laughs> we don't get to make any special deals. All right? uh, anybody, the Uno player that if someone lays a draw four, you can just keep stacking on top of it, and someone's left to like draw 35. Wait, that'd be hard with draw, draw 36. Uh, all right, there's no house rules with God. You don't get to, you know, negotiate with God and say, well, you know, this point here, let's play the game this way. No, God has told us what sin is, and that's the bottom line, all right? Uh, along that same line is we are guilty of breaking all the laws in God's sight. James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. It's easy to think, man, those murderers, Hamas, they deserve the wrath of God. But in God's eyes, we're guilty of, of breaking them all. And if you really think about that, and then the next point, I'm getting ahead of myself, is God loves us. Why? Why? We're guilty of breaking all of God's laws. We deserve God's wrath. We deserve right now to be killed and thrown into hell for eternity. Sometimes you can forget that. I use this verse in junior church sometimes. But I need to be reminded. I deserve hell. I'm a sinner who before salvation was guilty of breaking all of the law in God's sight. It's not like you just told a small lie, but you committed murder. We've broken the law. That's the end of the story in God's eyes. All right, uh, God loves us. That's the next point. And wants us in heaven. Now think back to the fact that we're sinners. And God loves us and wants us in heaven. And maybe, maybe somebody smart in here can tell me why. But he just decided to. It's not like we had anything to offer him. He loved us. Completely undeserved and wants us in heaven. He didn't wait for us to to get ourselves clean. He just loved us. In that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Again, that's a simple thought. But sometimes we miss it. I'm a sinner who deserves hell, who deserves hell, and God loves me. It should overwhelm us. All right, let's go on. God didn't just, you know, like say, I really love you, but it's unfortunate what's about to happen. He went on. He said, uh, Jesus died for our sins. First Peter 2, who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Christ died for our sins. We're coming into Christmas and celebrating his birth. That provided for us salvation. That we don't deserve. He never sinned. But he died for our sins. Maybe if you think about um, Mr. Petrell coming into one of you guys' room and giving you demerits for something your roommate had done. How many are going to just say, oh, I like my roommate. I'll just take it. <laughs> Joel said, absolutely, I don't like my roommate. So I, I'm not taking it. I don't know whose roommate is. Sorry for you. Uh, no. And the girls especially. Is, oof. 
it's ugly. I'm getting them fight, getting the girls fight. Um, but for something minor, we say, no, that's not right. I don't deserve it. Christ didn't just take a demerit he didn't deserve. He died for our sins. Willingly. Right? He died for our sins. <clears throat> And then the last point here, salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. He didn't, he didn't say, I love you and I'll die and then you kick in something and that, that'll make it. He provided everything. We just have to come to him in faith. Imagine, <clears throat> us that have children can imagine this easier, but imagine having a child <clears throat> and some drunk driver killing your child. And then the drunk driver comes and says, how much could I pay you to, to you know, replace that child? Uh, and sometimes we think we can come to God and say, oh, here, let me, let me give you something here to, to you know, kind of pay back for Christ's death. We, we can't offer him anything. And he still died for us and wants us in heaven. So if you're here and saved, never Get over that fact. Never. If there was not anything else in the Bible except to get to go to heaven when you die, that would be an amazing and wonderful thing. Right? Amazing and wonderful thing. So the simplicity that is in Christ. Salvation is truly amazing. And we should never, ever get over it. Um, <clears throat> Luke ten twenty. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen. That's what we should rejoice about. Amen. All right, let's go on now to the second part and look at some simple Bible doctrines and statements that should be just as profound as we think about them. Not profound because I'm saying them. This is God's word. And he, there's some simple ideas that we can uh, easily miss. Um, one quick illustration. Uh, being a Christian is pretty simple, the whole point, uh, but not easy. Now, if you've ever climbed a mountain or gone on a long hike or something like that, it's pretty simple. You just keep walking <laughs> until you get to the top and then you come back down. But it's not very easy. And a lot of Christianity is like that. It's some simple ideas. We know. We just got to keep on going. It's a simple idea, but not necessarily hard. Or, I'm sorry, but not necessarily easy. All right, the first thing I'll talk about is um, two times in the Bible, God summarizes our job on the earth. And I really like passages like this. Let's look, look at them. First one is Ecclesiastes 12, 13. If you want to turn there, that'd be good. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. <clears throat> This is my uh, teacher side coming out. I like nice, simple summaries. I know you're thinking, what, what teacher likes a simple summary? They like complicated and confusing because then kids fail their tests and they feel like they're smart. But that's not my, well, at least not my goal. Maybe Dr. Schreiber but, uh, <laughs> or, or Mr. Schrock, I don't know, but not my goal. We have a, a, a summary here that you know. All right, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. I mean, we can boil everything down we're supposed to do as a Christian into those two things. Fear God, keep his commandments. You'll spend a lifetime trying to get that done. All right, first thing, fear God. The whole point there is to fear God, revere God. He is God Almighty. Who are we to think we can... We can mess with him. So we need to fear God. We can't possibly fear lots of other things. Or maybe let other things govern our actions and not what God says. That means we'd be fearing those other things more than what God says. Could be money problems. We need money. If you don't, I'll relieve you of the burden. Just give it to me. All right. <laughs> uh, we need money. You've got bills to pay. You can let your fear of money or the need of money or some bill coming down the line, a school bill, please pay that, uh, or other things that, that you have to do, 
calls you to do things that you know God doesn't want you do, to do. The fear of money problems is governing your life, not the fear of God. Uh, it could be the fear of uh, missing out on something that seems like it'll be fun. Again, Satan's good at dangling those things out there. Like, oh, that would be so much fun if I just, hopefully you've never had this thought, hopefully, if I just wasn't a Christian and had to be in church on Sundays, I could go, Satan's dangling that thing out there. And if, if you take that bait, your fear of missing out on that thing is governing your life, not the fear of God. Um, I grew up in West Virginia on what we call the hill. I don't know. As a kid, it was like a three and a half or four mile long straight driveway straight up this mountainside. It's about 100 yards long, uh, but it seemed gigantic as a kid. Um, <clears throat> and my dad, let me back up. Um, we used to have to walk home from the bottom of the hill on certain days. Some days my mom would pick everybody up and drop them off and we'd drive home. The other days we'd have to walk home, you know, like half a mile or something. Um, but I remember as this big dog that I thought wanted to eat me, being loose there. Uh, and it, it, it controlled every action I took from the time I got out of the car <laughs> to the time I survived and made it home. The fear of that dog. There were times where my, the fear of my dad didn't govern my actions. That same hill, we were told, never go sledding down it. Some of you guys that have been there know the bottom goes right into that <laughs> other road, a, a much more main highway. Doesn't flatten, comes down and hits that road, well, maybe an angle like that. Um, and as a kid, I thought, what's the problem with that? <laughs> it's this great hill, straight down. Uh, so one day, the fear of my dad did not govern my actions. All right, and I went sliding down the hill, nothing happened, nobody died. Uh, I did get in trouble. Um, you know, we went down the hill, and you know, before we got to the bottom, we'd just roll off our sled and, and claw into the snow. <laughs> and we all managed to stop in time. We thought it was great fun. Um, but there, the fear of my dad did not govern my actions. My desire to have fun governed my actions. And when we talk about fearing God, it should govern our actions everywhere we go, everything in life. What does God want? What does my heavenly Father say about this? Right? And really, if you get that down, the other side comes almost automatically. <laughs> I'll keep your commandments, God. You got my attention. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's one time God summarizes this whole thing. Go over to the New Testament, uh, Matthew 22. Uh, Jesus summarizes again all of the law and the prophets, and you're probably thinking of the passage already. Matthew 22, verse 35. And then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, what a dumb thing, but another topic for another day. Master, which is the greatest commandment, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then Jesus went on. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So again there we have a summary of our Christian life basically. Love God, love your neighbor. Love God. That's going to push us to live a clean life. It's going to push us to get into his word and read it. We'll talk about that later. It's going to push us to please him if we love him. And then love your neighbor. Do things that, that are going to make your that are going to benefit your neighbor. You can think about folks in this room, loving them. You can talk about the unsaved and loving them. Hopefully, uh, you don't uh, gossip and steal from your roommates. Maybe Joel does. I don't know. That's why no one likes him. Uh, but that's not loving your neighbor. Right? If we never warn the lost about hell, how can we claim that we love them? Right? So, love God, love your neighbor. Everything we should do as a Christian can, can be funneled through those two ideas. It doesn't have to be complicated. Love God, love your neighbor. The other summary was fear God 
and keep his commandments. It's pretty simple. Right? There's no you know, 18 point uh, comparison that you have to remember on a test next week. Two, fear God, keep his commandments, or love God, love your neighbor. Pretty simple. Let's go on and talk about some other simple ideas that should profoundly infect, affect us. This one Dr. Vogelin hit on Sunday night. Um, we are going to heaven if we're saved. We're going to heaven if we're saved. First Timothy 6, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now that seems like a long ways off. All right? For me, it seems like a long ways off. But it's going to happen. I'm going to heaven. Most of you know my dad died November the 2nd. Um, he went to heaven. Just like that. It's present with the Lord. I was, uh, he signed a lot of correspondence, maybe today, emails and things referring to Christ's return. But, but that was his day. He went, went from sick in bed to heaven. That's amazing. I was driving actually to go see him when I, I got word of it. And I just, you know, I was sad. My father died. But on the other hand, I, I was so thrilled. This verse has never seen more real. My dad's in heaven. And Pastor Mitchell, I actually have a comment in here that you made. Uh, you said your dad will enjoy heaven. I don't know if you remember saying that to me. He is. He's enjoying heaven. We're going to heaven. Why do we make this world so important? We heard something tonight about our citizenship being in heaven. We're going, or it should be in heaven, not on this earth. <clears throat> Uh, in this world, uh, we have to fight our flesh. We have to fight Satan and his temptations. We have to fight being in love with the world. The Bible talks us about it being soldiers, strangers we heard about Sunday night. In heaven, <clears throat> your tears are wiped away. We have rest from our sinful flesh. If, that doesn't, if that's not appealing to you, that you may not be fighting your sinful flesh very much. Our flesh likes to sin, and it's a fight. Yes. And in heaven, that's gone. Amen. No sinful flesh. Rest from Satan's attacks. Continual fellowship with God. It's going to happen. Someday you'll be in heaven. And you could spend this little blink of time focused on things that don't matter. Or you could realize, I'm going to be in heaven. I'm going to do something that affects eternity. I read a book years ago uh, about a guy named Ernest Shackleton who went on and tried to get to the South Pole um, and got stuck in the ice. Really kind of an amazing story. But these guys got stuck in the ice and lived on ice floes. And sorry, girls, they would beat little seals over the head with clubs and eat them. Uh, Peter was not very happy. This is about 120 years ago. But anyway, they'd been stuck on the ice for, I don't know, I forget, 18 or 20 months. And a rescue ship came. And I, this, this, this part in the story is burned in my mind because it illustrates this. Uh, it talked about these guys and the little things they had saved. They had pieces of bone or a piece of string, these little trinkets. And as soon as the rescue boat showed up, they walked away from it. At one point, that was all, you know, they were careful of their little treasures until a rescue boat came, and they'd have walked away from it. If we're not careful, we're going to live our life consumed with these little treasures. And when we get to heaven, we'll look back and say, wow, that was dumb. We're going to heaven. That should affect our entire life, everything about it. All right, let's go on. We're going to heaven. The next one is the Bible is complete and inerrant. It is the word of God. The book you have in front of you, complete. We can read it and have confidence that it is true. <clears throat> you know this, but again, just remind ourselves, it's scientifically accurate. If it speaks about science, it's true. <clears throat> if science disagrees with it, give science time to catch up. <laughs> it, it, it is interesting that uh, 
evolutionists have to keep changing their theory to match the new discoveries. This, this book hasn't changed. Right? At some point, we'd think, okay, if, if you're in court and one witness never changes a story and the other witness keeps changing their story, at some point you say, I think he's lying. <laughs> and the Bible is scientifically accurate. It's historically accurate. Right? Uh, there are a, a plethora of uh, numbers of stories about uh, archaeologists and historians who said, oh, these stories in the Bible never happened until... <laughs> Until they found them, they found the cities, they found evidence of it. Uh, Pilate didn't exist, uh, all kinds of things. King David never really existed until they found his palace. It's kind of hard to ignore that. Uh, one of my favorites uh, was um, the temples of the, the Philistines, where it talks about Samson pushing them down. People say, oh, that's kind of ridiculous. Think about this building. You know, you could go push down two columns. And, you know, maybe there might be a little bit of cave but the building is not going to collapse. So people said, oh, that's silly, until they found the ruins of these temples, and they rested on two columns. There's two columns that if they got knocked down, the whole structure is coming, just like God described. So the Bible is true. It's accurate. Historically, <clears throat> um, these teachings about doctrine are all correct and accurate. We don't have to wonder, like, oh. Did God mess up here? It's true. It's also, it's complete. It's all we need. It's the only source of absolute truth. And it's also our spiritual food. And we need to partake of it daily. Stephen Gunsenhauser made fun of me. Asked if we were going to go to Psalms. <laughs> he wasn't making fun of me. Psalms 1 talks about, we don't have to go there. Um, we delighting and meditating in God's word. This book is complete and inerrant. Do you appreciate it? Do you go days on end without ever really getting into it? It's God's word. Simple thought. But it should affect us. All right, let's go on to the next one. <clears throat> the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God. Everything. My dad died. You can probably think of some things that I'm thankful for. He's in heaven. I, I uh, enjoyed his funeral. I'm not that sure it's the right way to describe it. Um, but it was thrilling to me to hear about all kinds of people, some that I very distantly knew, uh, who my dad had affected for God. The whole funeral could have been about how, how wise he was with investments or what a great engineer he was, but it wasn't. I'm thankful. My dad was known for being a Christian. Right? I'm thankful for that. I'm um, sorry, getting ahead of myself. It's easy to be thankful for, and I've got quotation marks, good things. You get good grades? Amen. Thank you, God. Uh, you get a pay raise. You have uh, fun on Christmas lights. Chicago tonight? Or someplace else? So What's that? Okay, so you try, nobody should get shot then, so that'd be good. All right, you have a good time with your friends tonight. You can come back home and thank God for that. Uh, fun vacation, right? But we also, the Bible says all things. So we're going to be thankful for the things we consider bad. Romans 8 all things work together for good. And it goes on from there, but everything. This is another example of where our faith steps in. We may not see how it works together, but God tells us it does. Uh, Spurgeon, in his book, Lectures to My Students, dealt with this idea once. And someone asked him, or some other question was posed, how can you be thankful that you got mugged? Sorry, no pun about Chicago tonight. Uh, how can you be thankful that you got mugged? And I just remember a couple of his answers. One thing he said was, you can be thankful that you got mugged and that you weren't the one doing the mugging. If we're going to be on one side, I'd rather be mugged than be the career criminal. You can be thankful that they just took money. I mean, we talked about it's just money. It won't be worth much in heaven. Took something of no real value. Even in that, 
we can be thankful. We've got to have enough faith to trust God in the bad things. Sickness, injury, death, financial loss, car crashes. I don't know if anybody's had a car crash. Thankful. I heard an illustration once. This was about history and how um, you're, there's some distance from an event in history gives you a better perspective on it. But I think it fits here, too. If you can imagine a big mural, maybe the whole from door to door back there, and you're right up against it, and you can see about this much right in front of your face. You don't have a very good idea of what's happening. But as you step back, you get a bigger and bigger and bigger picture. And God never promises that we're going to stand back and see the whole picture, at least on earth. But he does promise us, whatever you're seeing that looks bad, it's working out for good. And that's what we've got to, you don't have to show me, God. I'm going to trust you. In everything, give thanks. There are things in life that I, you can come and say, how can I, how can I be thankful? I, I don't know. I don't know what the good is that's coming, but I trust God. And he says that we should be thankful in all things. In everything, give thanks. One more example, or one more illustration of this simple idea. Proverbs 11.30. He that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. Imagine if it said this. He that eateth chocolate is wise. We would eat chocolate at every opportunity. We would eat more often than we were required to by school rules. We would eat when it was cold outside. We would eat when it was hot outside. We would even eat chocolate when it was raining outside. We would not make silly excuses about this not being the right time to eat chocolate. We would eat chocolate even when we're not involved in our ministries. We would look for extra chocolate to eat, just in case. Okay. Replace winning souls in every statement. And if you're like me, it's convicting. I'll win souls at every opportunity. How many times do I go back by the cashier and give them money? But no track. Uh, I would soul win more often than required by the school. Like I have, I'm faithful to my ministries. That's good. But God says we're wise if we win souls, not if we show up for our ministries. I would win souls when it's cold, when it's hot. If you're, at least for me, uh, whenever it's time to go canvassing, all of a sudden I'm super tired. My back hurts, my feet hurts, I have to go to the restroom, and I'm looking up, so, oh, there's a cloud there, it might possibly rain. <laughs> or, you know, it's 90, I don't want these people to open their doors and lose their air conditioning, so I'll just let them go to hell. <laughs> we, we make up all these really stupid excuses. Um, winning souls is wise. Now think about you. By that standard, how much of a fool are we or are you? The Bible doesn't say if you told a good story on Saturday, it's if you win souls, you're wise. How much time of our week do we spend doing things by that assessment that are completely foolish? Again, there's things we have to do. I don't want you to... You know, don't go hyper-spiritual and say, I'm going to flunk my classes, and, but I'm soul winning. No, God wants you to pass your classes too. There's, we have to look at the whole Bible. But how much soul winning do we do? God says we're wise if we win souls, and then the opposite of that would be we're foolish if we don't. From the seventh graders all the way up, winning souls is wise. Simple idea, but to me a very convicting idea. All right, let's summarize this real quick. We started out talking about salvation. If you're not saved, today is the day. I like Pastor Burke that said the Bible tells us the best day to get saved. It's today. All right? If you are saved, never, ever get over it. Amen. Ever. Amen. 
And then we talked about several simple Bible truths that should just reverberate through our life. Fear God, keep his commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. We're going to heaven. The Bible's true and accurate. Giving thanks. Winning souls. And there's others we could, we could look at. But I think that's sufficient. Pretty simple. Don't let Satan complicate it. The simplicity that is in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would help us as we think about these topics and how it is very simple. None of us can claim we don't understand. Lord, help us to have enough faith to step out and obey. Or enough fear of you to step out and obey. Lord, we ask that you would uh, pierce us into our hearts and show us where we need to live better for you and ways we can improve in that. Lord, again, we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.